Bem-vindos ao Type Theory for All Podcast, episode number 6. Today we interview Zina Magid, a PhD student at University of California, Los Angeles. She researches graduate types and had a paper published at Popo 2020 named What is Decidable About Graduate Types? Today we spend most of the time asking dumb questions, not only about graduate types, but also on intersection types and recursive types. Honestly, I cringed a lot during the editing of the episode, but hey, being dumb is a significant part of what it means to be in academia. So I hope you guys enjoy this episode, and let's get into it! Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Zina McGeed. Welcome, Zina. Thank you. <laughs> did, you did you like that introduction? It was very special just for you. I thought the other one was nicer. How did I do that last time? I don't know. It, just, it was more dramatic. The performance was more dramatic. Oh, but last time was Yves Berto. Like, I mean, I have, I have to, to make a good thing. No, no, no. No, 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 now, like, before we were... Oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm so new to this, this podcast thing, so I'm still, still trying to get things right, you know? I think I think I found my, my intro to, to the guest, right? Good. Anyways, how, how are you doing today? Good. Good weather. Yeah. We're opening up again in LA. Well, here it's just yeah. started raining again. It's kind of... It's, it, it was really good up to now, but now it's raining. It's sad. Anyways. Yeah. How about start talking a little bit about about yourself, Zina? Tell us about you. Tell us how you got working on gradual types and how you got to UCLA. The gradual types thing was an accident, kind of. I was at Northeastern for my undergrad, and um, I was having an internship. So Northeastern requires you to do an internship, and hmm. it takes six months. I was doing QA. What is that? Qu quality assurance. I was doing testing. Oh, okay. I've been there. That's great. It's really good. <laughs> manual. <laughs> manual <laughs> testing as well. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. And they required me to learn Python, though. It was, it was in Python. And I was th thinking, like, I was just sitting there one day, and I was thinking, like, you know how they tell you in order to attract the employer as an undergrad? Like, when you graduate, you want to attract the employer, you do some projects, some extracurricular projects so that you can show that you're having interests outside of academia. Yeah. So, you know, I, and I thought, you know, since I'm learning Python, uh, what about a new project in Python? So I just Googled, you know, Python projects. <laughs> and, and then one of them was <laughs> like pretty straightforward thinking, to be honest, and it's not complicated at all. So one of them, I just, there were a bunch and I thought, oh, Python interpreter. I didn't really know like what it was. It just sounded cool. So I just picked it and I just started coding and like, I obviously didn't know what I was doing. So it sounded similar to something that, um, right. So like backtrack of it, uh, when I was doing my fundamentals course, like the first course you ever take at Northeastern. I had Matthias Felizen as a professor. Wow. And you know what? Well, yeah. Right. He's cool. Yeah, yeah. I think he's cool. Um, and so I knew that he could help me with this. It's just um, I wasn't sure how to approach it, but I was, you know, I just I emailed him and I said, I'm working on this thing. I'm kind of stuck. Do you have any recommendation on how to approach the problem? And of course, he messaged me back. Oh, like, you need to go back to fundamentals one. Like, this is not what I taught you because I was messing up. I wasn't doing it correctly. <laughs> so, and eventually, yeah. <laughs> it's something that he would do, right? So, yeah, yeah, I can, um, I can see that. Yeah. So after a little bit of back and forth, I just asked him, you know, would it be okay for you to look for look at this for, for a few minutes, like the actual code? Because it was kind of hard to communicate through the email about the code. So, so, you know, he, he said, okay, we met up and he took a look at, at it. And basically that meeting lasted for like four hours. And then it became a weekly thing where, you know, every week we'll just like work on it. And that's how I learned all the fundamentals of PL. I didn't take a PL course at this point or anything, pretty much nothing. Um, 
and that's how it, like everything dynamic typing scoping you know evaluation like in, doing an interpreter those basic things that's how I learned and then he was like I think maybe he saw that um it, research would be a good idea like I have you know I have that interest and he thought this could be a good idea so he he has another PhD student he was working on something similar and he said that you know we can work together on something so that was the very first paper was gradual types and it was uh, reticulated python similar so there was a paper called obviously uh, is sound gradual typing dead the one from asumo that was i believe it was a pldi paper so that was a paper that measured the performance of a gradually typed language type track it it measured the performance of like basically how it scales and what happens when you try different typed and untyped combinations. And the idea was to do something similar for reticulated Python. Uh, so, so yeah, that's what we, that's what we worked on. And then, and obviously the USCLA thing followed. So. Wait, but then where you also did this undergraduate research project, is that, is that it? That was working with Matthias? Oh, I see. Yes. Okay. That was with Ben, Ben Greenman. Yeah. So then you started learning about gradual types to apply it to reticulated Python. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm just impressed, honestly, because like you didn't actually, in your undergrad, you didn't actually take an undergrad, you know, like any programming languages course, but you literally just learn directly from the fountain, from one of the guys who are really knowledgeable about it in our field directly, you know? Mm -hmm. That is really cool. That's impressive. Good for you. That's yeah. But but I mean, after that, <laughs> before I graduate, I did take a class and then. But to be honest, he taught most of the things that I needed for that research. Yeah, so. yeah. That's what that's what how you learn the most, right? Yeah. Like you actually are needing the stuff that you yeah. are learning. Then, which is why doing research, you learn a lot more than actually taking classes because most of the time in the class, you're like. I couldn't care less about what's going on over here, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Right, right. Okay, so what's what's actually gradual types then? Tell us all about all about what's this cool cool thing. All about it. Yeah. Right. Um, okay, so there there are a lot of definitions that you hear. So people. Uh, oftentimes use optional typing and gradual typing interchangeably, hmm. but they're a bit different. So, so if you, for example, ask Jeremy, he would probably say optional typing is when you have the possibility of either adding an annotation or removing an annotation. That's fine. Uh, and that's kind of similar to Python. Python 3.5 and above, I believe, has the ability to add annotations. But I mean, when you run the program, nothing actually happens in runtime with those annotations. Okay. So if there are some static issues, right? So if you type a function with an integer and maybe something else is typed as a Boolean statically, then it can stop you. But in runtime, nothing actually happens with those. Mm -hmm. So that's optional, optional typing. Whereas gradual typing, when you run, um, so let's say you type a function, it takes an integer. Um, gradual typing is going to generate a runtime check that ensures that in runtime, that function only takes integers. So it, it ensures that it's used correctly. So the main difference is the runtime checks. That's why I the see. performance thing comes I up. I see. OK, yeah. so basically. So optional typing has no runtime checks. Right. Optional types has no runtime checks, but gradual types generate these runtime checks to make sure that everything is, is properly, will, will run properly, right? And maybe, yeah. maybe I got this very wrong, but so in optional types, it's basically going to it's going to make sure that everything types checks during when you're writing your program, say like during linting, for example, because we're, we're not going to compile, say, Python, right? So it's going to make sure that everything is properly typed. But then once it gets to the runtime, actually, when you're running your code, then those types doesn't matter. It's basically throwing all of that information away in some sense, right? Yeah, yeah. And the problem is that usually you don't actually have all the information to know if things are well typed statically right when yeah. you have all the types that's that's great but but most of the time you don't and sometimes the language doesn't even have 
when you're in the dynamically typed um, language, sometimes you can't type certain programs. Like the language just doesn't have the expressivity to type all the possible programs in the language. Right, right. right? Which actually so, brings to some some yeah. desirability results that you've been working on for the past few years, right? Yeah, we're gonna yeah, get yeah, there. Yeah. That's the big, that's the big challenge, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So how does it actually? How does gradual type differentiate? from type inference in Haskell? Because in a sense, Haskell, you also have the option to not type your program, right? Yeah, so with with gradual typing, it's supposed to be for, so one of the benefits or one of the like reasons that we, that gradual typing is useful is that you want to incrementally type your program, okay? So let's say you have a large Python code base and you would like to add some type annotation. You don't want to do that at once because mm -hmm. sometimes the code base is too large, but you want to start to incrementally add the type so that every step it still type checks, um, but but there's some untyped code and that's okay, it still runs. Oh my God, I, I must be the most dumb person in the world because I just realized why is it gradually typed. <laughs> Makes so much, yeah, much more sense the... now. <laughs> Makes so much more sense now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's why it's the amount of yeah there's so many memes now and like just my friends in the lab like the word gradual everything just they make so many jokes about that now like what oh you're gonna do this gradually everything i do like, oh, <laughs> you can do this gradually <laughs> <laughs> no but okay so you were saying that you want to gradually annotate your program so that it becomes slowly more precise in a sense yeah more typed uh and more precise so it's actually the same thing there is yeah. a precision relation so it's every gradually typed system the the first or one of the first steps you do to take a language from static to gradual is you take the static language and then you add the dynamic type which is stands for no type information it's the same as no annotation and then you define a precision relation on the types and the terms of the language and okay mm -hmm. so this is how uh, Ron Garcia and Matteo Cimini defined it. It's how to gradualize um, systems. The precision relation is kind of like you're comparing the, I believe there's a definition for this already. It's like you have two trees, they're exactly the same, but they differ on the dynamic type only. So the trees are pretty much exactly the same, but on the places where one of them has a static type, the corresponding tree has a dynamic type in that exact spot. So the rule is like, let's say the types are int, bool, and error. Then the precision relation would say that the dynamic type is less precise than everything. And then for the arrow type, like let's say t1 arrow t2, that's less precise than t1 prime arrow t2 prime. If t1 is less precise than t1 prime, t2 less precise than t2 prime. And that's how it extends to terms, to everything. Mm -hmm. Any other constructors besides arrow. Right, so so it's a like a simple definition, really, um, not like subtyping or anything like that. Right, it's like right. naive subtyping, actually. In what sense? Because in the arrow, um, in the arrow type, in in naive subtyping, they don't reverse the um, the thing. Like so, t one arrow t two, in naive subtyping, it would be the same order. Right. Right, but in other subtyping, the order is reversed. Precision just says T1 error 2 is less precise than T1 prime error T2 prime. If T1 prime is less precise than, than T2, T2 prime less precise. So it doesn't reverse them like right, in subtyping. Right. There, there is and a name that, that, that's in mathematics sub... for it, for right? Like it's the counter, what's the name? Oh my God. Contra, contra. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, you're the mathematician. You, you know this stuff. I you're the it, real mathematician. I here. thought you were the mathematician. Come on. No, 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 no. You work on proof assistants. Like, <laughs> I don't if, compare. If you, like... tell, if you tell a mathematician that anyone who works on proof, mat proof assistant is a mathematician, they're going to laugh at your face. They're going to be like, ha. <laughs> yeah, actually, sure. Actually, I, I went... Okay, actually, it reminds me of something. So I went to... I was working on this maximality problem that was driving us crazy for a while. And I went to um, 
Professor, I can't say his name properly. Yanni something. He Yanis is a Hedges. set theorist. No, no, no. Um, well, I don't know if I can maybe get his name. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, I'll tell me if you can pronounce this. Yenis Mos. Oh my God, we're just gonna butcher this. Yenis Moskovakis. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So the point is, his his advisor, his advisor was clean, right? Oh, okay. And. So it is really cool. Okay, so he works on set theory, has some work on lambda calculus. So I went to him once and I told him about this problem. And he was like, oh, you know, this is fine, whatever. But I think this is too applied. And <laughs> so, I mean, for him, <laughs> I don't do this kind of applied work. <laughs> To apply, <laughs> it's it's too close too close to computer science. To applied, to applied. You can actually you can actually run this stuff. This is this is, this is not fun. <laughs> yeah, we don't do this so, stuff here. Get get away from here. On a similar note, we had Dana Scott visit one day, and he was giving a lecture for the mathematics department, not for us. Okay, it was for the yeah. math department obviously and he was like trying to describe all the topology and everything behind the lambda calculus and how it was derived and was telling us the actual story and oh when church oh. came up with this he didn't really like it or just like yeah. and i was thinking if they see what we do to the lambda calculus like we just <laughs> define it and we just... <laughs> then it's got his actually yeah. he's actually behind domain theory right so, oh God, yeah, the notational semantics yeah. and all of that, things got very hairy and very, very mathematical there. Oh my God. Yeah. I wish I was there. I envy you so much. Anyway, so coming, coming back, we were talking about yeah. the precision relation and how the arrow T1, arrow T2 is more precise than T3, arrow T4. Then the head of the arrow must be more precise than the head of the other arrow and and the same thing for the results, right? And that's kind of like the yeah. core of how you are making your types slowly more precise and giving this a more formal definition of how your calculus work. And actually, I have your paper open here. What is decidable about gradual types from Popo 20? It's, it's a pretty cool paper. It's neat. And I can see here that I feel it's the usual approach to define gradual types over the simple type lambda calculus. Is that correct? Yeah. And all the results that you guys been working on and proving is applying, is studying gradual types over the simple type lambda calculus. And I was curious, is there any, any work happening on a more polymorphic lambda calculus, like, you know, like system F or something like that? Um, I don't think that there's something exactly like this at least i haven't seen anything that was similar but for the polymorphic lambda calculus the main issue is that those things don't scale right now so those are just decidability results and we know that if you go for something that's a superset of this language it's going to get only it can only get worse right but we've been looking at so we've you know we've thought of continuing this line of work and we've been looking at intersection types so more to go into the set theoretic type direction uh, and you know intersection types can be viewed as a special form of polymorphism right it allows you to do overloading and that seemed to go well but we had to do a lot of changes yeah it strikes me that intersection types it's something that you can you cannot actually have on a stat stat statically typed language right so damn this is this is a, a nice... Why not? Why not? What do you mean? What do you mean? There is some lambda calculus results that, you know, like, because this is the intersection types is actually something that happens only when you have the church encoding of the lambda term. So you cannot actually type. Oh, you want Oh, yeah. Okay. You're talking about, like, type inference is undecidable for, like, fully fledged uh, set theoretic types? Because that's the result, yeah. So you can you can actually have intersection types on a statically typed language. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, of course. Oh, okay. I thought you couldn't. That's you fine. You just added to it. No, no, 
Good. But but you can do inference. Like if you want to infer for any program you want, if you just have the fully fledged set theoretic types, um, you cannot do inference for everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's undecidable. Okay. But we can restrict it. So there is there is actually a very interesting subset of set theoretic types. It's called rank two intersection types, and that problem is decidable there. There is a so there's a really nice paper uh, by Trevor Jim. It's called Rank Two Type Systems and Recursive Definitions, and that shows that for rank two you can do type inference. It's a what it so the rank two intersection types. It's a restricted form of intersection. You can't just put intersection anywhere in the type. Mm -hmm. It um, the tree has to like have a certain form. There you can think of it as more shallow intersection types right. so they're more on the, the intersections are kind of on the top level so maybe we should go back a little bit and you give a brief explanation of what an intersection type actually is okay so as far as the what the tree looks like you just have this extra constructor right the mm -hmm. the end thing and um what it means that depends on the type rules but typically what it means is in in set theoretic systems you don't have uniqueness property right mm -hmm. so a lot of systems every term has one unique type right with set theoretic yeah you don't usually get the uniqueness property and so what that means is let's say i have a function application and let's say the domain of my function has an intersection of different types you want the argument to type check with every single thing that's in the intersection of the domain Hmm. that's how you type check those. That's what it means. It just, it has all of those types. Right. It means that the thing has all of those types. And, you know, there are a lot of different systems. Like people have all kinds of definitions, you know, like, for example, a lot of one common property in set theoretic types is the associative property, the commute, uh, commutivity, those, those sorts of things. Idempotency. But are they, not all systems have them. It just it depends. So mm -hmm. you can... mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. How about we shift gears towards talking about some results in your paper? Because your paper is pretty cool. It has some really new results on what is happening in gradual types, right? And I can see here that you could solve four problems, basically, which is the singleton problem, the type choice problem, the finiteness problem, and the maximality problem. Do you want to give a brief explanation of what's happening here? Yes. Uh, those are the four most important open problems in the century. So we <laughs> Bring her an award, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. I want four awards. <laughs> One for each, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, so um, a lot of work on gradual types was towards gradualizing systems, measuring performance, um, but we wanted to look at how efficient it would be to actually, because, you know, when, when you have this, this Python program we talked about, this untyped Python program, and a programmer is trying to add some annotations, one of the main issues is that they, it's just tedious, the programmer doesn't usually want to sit there and type in every single annotation for a large code base. So we wanted to know how, how feasible it would be to automate this process. And those problems are geared towards that. We want to have some level of automation and, and these questions capture sort of how efficient it would be to, to do this automatically. And also we want to know if this is even possible. So those four problems, so for example, one of them, uh, it's the finiteness problem, and it tells you whether you're dealing with infinitely many possibilities for making your program more static, or are the possibilities finite, mm. right? Right. One, one other uh, decidability problem was the top choice. Or actually, let me tell you about the singleton. So the singleton says, is this program as static as possible or not? Mm -hmm. Or could we make it better? That problem is easy. You can do this in polynomial time, but that's what the problem is asking. Is this the most precise I can make my program? And then again, the finiteness tells you if there are infinitely many possibilities for making the program more static or not. 
And then top choice is just a combination of those two things. It says, is there a program that is precise than everything else in the space? So all the other different possibilities, is there this like one thing that is better than everything already that's here? So you can think of it as like a tree and then like, like a lattice, you can think of it as there's a dot here, which is the program and it goes like this and then it converges to one point. Like a diamond. Yeah, like a diamond. Um, that would be a top choice. Right, right. It can go to different to different choices, but then it comes together in one single choice at the end, right? Right. Um, and then the last one, and that's the hardest problem so far, and that's the maximality problem. And it says, does this program have a migration or like some annotations? Can I annotate it in a way such that it does not have any more improvement. That's maximal migration. How does it? How is it different from top, top choice? Uh, maximal migration does not converge to a dot. It's not a diamond. The mm -hmm. lattice may not be a diamond. It can be, so you start with a program and then you're just looking for this one point that doesn't have anything better. I see, I see. But then you can have all of those paths. You can have like infinite paths in between, but you just want right. to reach this one finite path. Right, right. So basically you want to do some sort like if you if you do some um naive search as in if you do depth first search here then you can get on an infinite branch and then you're screwed right so you want to do some a breadth first search here Yes Right You do a breadth first search for a semi algorithm you don't even get an algorithm for Why that not? you do because all paths could be infinite Oh right right of course we huh. don't know. We we don't actually know. Yeah, we don't know if one path is fine. We we can say that the whole space is infinite, but that could be because of one path. We don't know a way to say is that individual branch finite or not. That's that's why that you know. So it's, it's an empty hard one. problem, and we right. don't know. I can like tell you maybe a little bit about how the lattice works. It's pretty simple, but that's the idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't know about individual paths, so. So you actually you actually are sure that this is a, an an NP hard problem. How how do you prove that? Yeah. So oh my god, this was uh, a reduction to three sat, and we don't actually know that it's an NP. We don't we don't know that it's an NP actually. So it's just it's just NP hard. So right, that's pretty cool. That's that's nice. That's pretty nice. Any other interesting result that I failed to capture? in my building the questions here? I think, no, I think this is, yeah, those are the problems. And the question for the future would be whether this maximality problem is decidable or not. We still don't know. And also how those things scale with larger systems. So how do those results carry over? I mean, those are, especially the maximality problem, that's a lower bound, but the rest are upper bound. Right, right. So yeah, so there there could be room for improvement there. What other problems do we have in gradual typing? Open problems, I mean. Performances, yeah. I mean, performance people are still always improving on that, and it varies by the language. So, for example, in typed racket, uh, there was work done on what is the performance of. So, so they take the untyped program and then they try different possibilities of like typed versus untyped. So type bracket is called a macro gradual typing system. Uh, what that means is that you have to type an entire module at a time. So something, so when you choose to type something, it has to be a whole module. You can't, you know, do it on a granularity of like functions or something. So that, yeah, so that leaves you with Let's say you have n modules, that leaves you with two to the n possibilities of typed versus untyped. And then, you know, they, they did some tests on how fast each configuration was. And I think it was something like the if you have fully typed uh, configurations, those actually do better than the ones that are in between and, and so on. And then also the ones that are not typed at all, of course, those are fast because you don't have checks. So that was that. And then for, let's say for reticulated, that's a micro gradual typing system. So you have so many more possibilities. You mean reticulated Python? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's a, a micro 
system. Okay. Um, and that means that, of course, you can, yeah, you, you have so many possibilities. We couldn't actually do every single configuration because that was just too much. So you have to randomly pick. But anyway, in that language, I, it wasn't exactly like that. It was like the more typed, the slower it was because it generated runtime checks for everything. I don't know if they, if they made some more modifications to the language, but a lot of it depends on the uh, design. So maybe there could be designs that just improve the, the performance. There was also work on, this was last popple. They were working on just combining gradual typing with different advanced systems. Mm. So, you know, so, so one of the thing I told you about with rank, the rank two intersections, right? Right. When we, so we were looking at, you know, making a gradual system out of those and it wasn't straightforward to actually combine those two things. So gradual typing isn't always compatible with everything you can think of. So that's also one other thing is like how to do a good design of, of combining gradual types with other type systems. Right, right. It's actually, I was, yeah. this, I, I was doing some very deep research by opening Wikipedia. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Like that's that's when you know that the person <laughs> cool. is actually cool. aiming for a PhD, right? Open Wikipedia. Yeah. <laughs> and I actually could no, but this one this one's really cool because they have some examples of things that are using gradual types out there in the wild right now. And their lists their list basically consists of type racket, as you mentioned, closure, hack which is a Facebook language compiler for PHP. Yeah. We're adding some types over there. I have yep. a friend that works there. It's, it's really cool. Of course, TypeScript is also using some ideas of gradual typing to add types on JavaScript. Same goes for ECMAScript. They're kind of in the same, you know, family basket sort of thing. And reticulated Python. Cython as well also adds some gradual types over there. Pyre, which I'm not much sure, but it's also on the Python family. They also have this uh, C Perl, which adds some typing on Perl. I don't actually know if it's actually pronounced Perl or Pear or Peer. <laughs> I have no idea. And, <laughs> and there is also a language that goes on the other direction, which is basically taking away types, which I found, I found very interesting because C Sharp already has types. So like this statically typed language. And on 4.0, they added this dynamic declaration to make it less typed. So it kind of goes on the other other direction here. Sounds really cool. Very interesting question of how to make it still compatible with all the type systems that you, you, you already have, right? I mean, I guess that part is, yeah, that part. So that seems again, like kind of optional typing. Really? Yeah, you can just throw away the types. I suppose, in runtime. But why would you want to remove types? <laughs> They're so nice, right? <laughs> Everything that you ever needed yeah. and dreamed about as being a good programmer. Come on, yeah, I, I, I can, I can see your frustration here. You're like, I'm just trying to add types here, and you're trying to remove them. Come on. <laughs> I think, I think the biggest part is that some programs like the system sometimes cannot express some types so like if we have the simply type lambda calculus and you and you want to write the program lambda x x applied to x that's not going to type check right you know yeah yeah so that makes no sense so, 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 so yeah can you make that program make sense what, what do you mean? i mean like it's it's kind of a bogus yeah, program the, right? the y I mean... combinator no it's not no <laughs> Hmm. No, but it's for the Y combinator. Right, but the Y combinator you can express that type with recursive types, right? I know, but I'm saying like if you don't have that. Mm. Like but if you then... just have the simply typed. Mm. You're not buying it. You're not buying it. Let me tell you something else. So let's say you have a function in Python that sometimes takes an integer and sometimes takes a boolean. And let's and and then you know a lot of languages don't support intersections. Let's say, like this calculus, you know, it doesn't support the simply type lambda calculus doesn't support intersections. Okay. So, so if you have dynamic typing, you can still write the program, but you know, you don't have to type check it. For example, you can give it the dynamic type. Mm -hmm. 
I see I see what you're getting. You're saying that in order in order to express some types, you have some you might have to change the syntax of your language. It's not only about the types itself, the types and the the syntax they kind of go hand in hand in a sense. Yeah, it makes sense. No, no, wait, wait, wait. What I what I mean is like if you want a, a fully static language, you're limited to to only the programs that the types can express, you know? But if, if you want to write a program and you don't have the type for it, it just wouldn't type check. Oh, okay. Uh, I I, def I definitely understand what you're getting at. What I'm saying is that, okay, let's say now that I actually want to, I want, I want to type check this program that is happening here. And we have, we have some model yeah. of types on how to type check this. We, we don't, we don't even need to go all the way to intersection types. We could use some types, for example. But now in order for me to, to be able to use yeah. some types, I have to change the syntax of the language, which is not something you want. That was kind of, my backwards reasoning, you know? Yeah, the syntax, yeah, you have to change the syntax and the type checker. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to make a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So like, right. if, if your syntax is actually fixed, then, and then you're, you're, you're adding types on top of that, you know, like gradually adding types on top of that, then kind of, it seems kind of necessarily, kind of necessarily, you know, like, there are some programs that you we're not going to be able to type because, hmm, yeah, I see what you're getting at. Yes, yes, that's true. Yeah, I mean, it's not it's not necessarily necessarily because if you're if you're smart enough on how to build the language, then or even not. Anyways, I would have to think more about it. That's pretty cool. makes makes a lot of sense. Gradual types are nice. I'm out of questions to be honest. <laughs> I think this is good. We have we. Yeah, you're you're feel good about about it about what we have so far. Nothing else to add. Yeah, no, I think we're. I mean, this is a good like overview and everything. You know, it's good high level. I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, so, I agree. I yeah. Agree. Well. I can okay, stop again. Hmm? <laughs> say the say the exit phrase. Is there an exit <laughs> phrase, or did you just? <laughs> Yeah, just like cut you in the middle of your sentence, you know, like in like the middle of the explanation. So intersections, I, I cut you off. Yes, guys, that was it. That was a great episode. <laughs> well, okay then, Zina. I think we covered everything that you wanted to cover. I made you all the dumb questions that I wanted to make you. I hope that our listeners could learn as much as I did from you. And... Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thank you. Well, guys, that's it for this episode. I know it's a little on the short end, but it was still very fun. And it's not every day that I get to interview someone more cynical than myself. So if you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to share it, tweet it, or advertise by any means possible. That's what keeps us moving. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them at our website, www.typetheoryforall.com. And I hope to see you next time. <laughs>